hello and welcome to another episode of Back of the Grid. I'm your host this week, Tom, and I'm joined by Chris. Hello. And a returning Stu. Hello, I'm back. We're all here. Back. All three of us. We're all here. Full quota for a change. <laughs> You're back for what is probably one of the biggest podcasts so far this season in terms <laughs> of there are four active sessions to discuss and a race preview to do. Ugh. Yeah, but luckily the race was so crap <laughs> that there's not an awful lot to talk about. Really, yeah, the there? race notes like three don't talking cover that points much. from the entire Grand Prix. So if from this to be weekend, fair, yeah, we have to split it up into the most sections all season, but those contents of those sections is probably about the same as a normal weekend. <laughs> yeah, quite small. But I do have some. It's been a while since I've been on, and I do have some opinions for you. So. Look forward shall to we, it. Shall, shall we kick in? Fire up those twenty thumbs, folks. <laughs> spicy stew opinion. Uh, should we just dive in then? Yeah, let's just dive in. Do it. I guess we should start with... We didn't know this when we did the preview five days before the weekend started, which is bizarre in itself, but we did have a new sprint weekend format. Um General thoughts on the alternate format we had? Well, whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, that's that's the narrative that the FIA, FIA would like you to pursue, isn't it? Oh, here we the, go. Is is the format better than the old format? When the real the real narrative, I think, should probably be: should we be doing sprint races at all? Because every single comment and every single tweet I've seen in relation to Formula One sprint races from Formula One fans has just been negative for every 20 negative tweets about sprint races that i've seen in the last few weeks there's been maybe one or half of a positive remark in relation to them i mean yeah Yeah. (laughs) I'm, i'm largely in agreement with you like it was i preferred this format to the previous ones it fixed some problems i had with the previous format but like the issue yeah, isn't the format, is it? I, I mean, it, it didn't do enough fixing to make me think th- being a sprint weekend added anything at all to it. When you think of this race and think of like everything that we were talking about in the lead up to this race and how Baku is sort of a recipe or disaster for sprint races and, and there's always accidents, there's always crashes, there's going to be more running, it's going to be more dangerous, people, teams are going to run out of parts, budget cap, blah, blah, blah. Nothing happened. The whole weekend, just nothing happened. So all of that was kind of like moot anyway. So all of this worrying and all these extra spare parts that teams have brought up to, to sort of make up for the, the fact that we've got a sprint race and they're expecting loads of damage just never materialised. Um the the sprint qualifying i thought was was okay it was a bit a bit little bit fast a little maybe a little bit too hectic i think in places but it was entertaining um it was it was it was nice to try something different but i mm-hmm. i don't think it's i don't think the issue here is that sprint racers need their own qualifying session i think there's there's other ways of setting a grid for a sprint race while still giving the teams yeah. a bit of a bit more practice and a bit more window to get their cars in the right setup because I think that's another reason why it was boring race because no one really knew what the tires were going to do so no one could formulate any real strategy other than a bit of guesswork and they all went for the same guess and it, that's partly what made it boring I think mm. yeah like it it fixed. The, the biggest problem I've always had with the previous sprint format was that the sprint result deciding the grid for the Grand Prix meant it was just one long event split up. The fact that they've detached the two is a positive, yeah. but that's only a positive because it means the sprint's not interfering with the bit that people actually want to see anymore. Yeah. Like yeah. It, it almost highlighted how, by fixing that, it highlighted how inconsequential the entire sprint format seems. Like... Yeah, we had a bit of racing on Saturday. Basically, one interesting thing happened in that race. Yeah. And that was about it. Like, I, I don't know. I, I, think, I think there's elements of it that can lend to something interesting. Like, for example, doing the, the sprint shootout the way it was done 
you ended up with Albon qualifying seventh for that race, mm. um, which in and of itself is like, it sort of shows that under pressure, there's, you know, who's got some pace in that situation, if that makes sense. Like, I think there's definitely like glimmers of things that show why it could be a good thing, but it still doesn't feel right. And it it just felt, I was sort of, at first I was happy to, with the fact that we might get like four sessions that were kind of driving towards points essentially, because you've got, you know, a qualifying session for a sprint, which has points. And then you've got a qualifying session for a Grand Prix, which has points. So it's like four really meaningful sessions for the teams. But then things like Logan Sargent not being able to make the race because of his incident in the sprint shoot out yeah. kind of negates, well, why have that session if there's not going to be enough to... I mean, yeah, it's his fault for putting it in the wall. There's an element of that. But also had it maybe been spread out slightly differently. Like if you're going to do a quick fire session that works the way that that did... Why was that not the one on the Friday afternoon, evening, and then normal quali, maybe not before the sprint race? I don't know. Maybe it's because of the, the times that things take from an organisational point of yeah, view. Maybe. But Because we've never had qualifying and the sprint race on the same day. But I think there's elements of if you can time it right, that would make for a heck of a day, like qualifying as a morning session, on a Saturday and a sprint race is like a Sunday afternoon session in, you know, with, with a essentially like a, I don't know, like a support, everything in the middle. Cause at the minute, like supports yeah. are kind of scattered in, in between everything that happens on a Saturday normally. Cause you normally got FP three so, and qualifying. So, so you want the sprint race after the Grand Prix? No, after qualifying. Oh, you said Sunday. I thought you meant. Okay. Sorry, I meant Saturday. Then, if I said Sunday, Saturday. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think I, I like the idea because it did. That occurred to me. The idea of sort of doing the doing sprint qualifying on a Friday afternoon rather than the actual main qualifying. Because I feel to yeah. me, it feels like the two main things for the weekend are Grand Prix qualifying and the Grand mm -hmm. Prix, mm -hmm. and those two things should be the things that you have most access to in terms of like tuning in or going to see the yeah. race weekend. And the, yeah. the only way that's going to be it, the case is if it, if quality is on a Saturday and mm -hmm. races on a Sunday, everything else on a Grand Prix weekend should be substitute to those two events. Those two for me are the main events. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I get what they're doing. I get what former doing. They're trying to make it so that there's meaningful running every single day that they're there but to me this almost makes saturday kind of a non-day like saturday has become so much yeah. less important as a sprint day because yes you've got two events going on that day but that kind of like takes up then your whole saturday because you go in you're tuning in in the morning to watch sprint qualifying then you've got a four hour break between that and the sprint race and you just can't you can't devote that much of your weekend to watch it. No one is going to devote that much of their weekend to watching sport. Like it's, you, it takes up so much time. Like it's the, it means that you can't go out and do anything or you can't, you, you could never go out and like a, you couldn't watch qualifying and then go and do the rest of your day because you'd miss the sprint race. So yeah, it's really yeah. ridiculous. The, the mentality that is putting that weekend schedule together is the same mentality that wants a 23, 24 race calendar. It's the, oh, we will put stuff out there and people will want to watch it. And it's like, you've got to make it a product that people want to come and watch first. And like, they're very this, much putting the cart before the horse on that. I feel like there's a combination of um, wanting to have as many events as possible to appeal to as many different people as possible while simultaneously not being that bothered about somebody that wants to watch them all does that make sense like they're more interested in getting the new fans that might pull in from the new locations or the new mm. snappier formats than they are worried about 
long term people or heavily yeah. invested it's people like who want to watch everything anyway. and are going to get fatigued over it basically yeah, they're, like they're, the balance feels into, wrong they've turned into a mobile phone um network provider <laughs> <laughs> they need a retentions team. Yeah, they, yeah, they, they they give all the new customers all the good stuff, but the old yeah. customers they just don't really care. Exactly. About. Yeah. Um, I think like a lot. So I was wondering why the uh, why so much of the feedback from fans in comment sections on websites to articles and on Twitter and everywhere else is so negative. And I think like what it kind of boils down to is there are. In Formula One, I would say there are probably three main sets of stakeholders, right? You've got us, the fans, and all, all of all the people who are just tuning in and, and visiting Grand Prix and watching. Um, you've got FOM, and then you've got the teams and drivers. And there's no, it's impossible to keep all, all three of those part. Well, it's kind of FOM's job to make sure all three of those parties are happy, <laughs> but they seem to be only really worried about keeping themselves happy at the moment. Um, we as fans and the t- probably the teams as well look at Formula One as a sport and um, uh, entertainment, but not. We, we look at it as a legitimate sport. FOM look at Formula One from a totally different perspective. Formula One, uh, FOM don't see Formula One, as far as I can tell, FOM don't see Formula One as a sport. They see that as a pure entertainment business. And if your business is entertainment, you're not really interested in, you're, they're interested in the business. That's what, They're interested in the money that the business is mm-hmm. going to make and having a healthy business, right? So yep. think of it this way. If you were... If you were a, an Apple trader and you had 22 crates of apples every year that you had to sell and inside each of those crates is an apple, is your product. So imagine like a Grand Prix weekend and an apple might be a ticket or it might be a VIP ticket or it might be a, a signing event or it could be, you know, all these little peripheral things that go on around qualifying race practice sessions and stuff. If you can... If you're, if you're that business owner and if you can take some of those apples and put them in a separate box and sell them separately to sponsors, to other people, then you're going to make more money and your business is going to be more profitable and more effective. And that, for me, is why FOM are just completely ignoring everything all the fans and teams are saying and just steamrolling ahead with this awful idea. I... I, I I genuinely don't see the point in sprint races. I think they're a waste of time. I'd, so, I'd be interested to know the the line though between FOM and the FIA as to how much of it is FOM's decision and how much of it is the FIA's because for them to be able to organise, uh, sorry, to dish out points for the sprint race, for example, that must be FIA sanctioned. So there must be somebody sat at the FIA that's either helped come up with this with them or signed it off. So I don't think it's just one entity that's solely to blame. I think it's the pair of them. This is one of those where the line is really blurred. And yeah, I suppose the teams to a degree. The teams had to have agreed to this format change as well. Like, Yeah. I do do agree with what Stu was saying. Interestingly, actually... um, those of you listening a couple of weeks ago when Elizabeth Blackstock was on, she was talking a little bit about a similar thing in relation to F1's approach to um, America. And actually an article she wrote on that subject went live today. It's well worth a read. And it's same, much the same thing. It's just like the approach is trying to just be all things to all people and mm-hmm. Make as much money out of as many things as you can, and just yeah. kind of alienating the sport and the people that want to watch yeah. it in the process. It's it mm. is it's just a, a stinking money grab, and the most creepy, like perverse thing about the whole the whole thing around sprint races for me is the way the broadcast the broadcast teams are just fluffing up like it's this amazing thing like that is such yeah. a, oh what an amazing thing mm. you know sky sports yesterday you know, I, I mean i don't really watch it on sky sports these days but yeah even yesterday they were all sort of hamming up how great it was to do a sprint race how great this new format is and like i said the narrative isn't 
is this Pe- format better than the old format? It. Yeah, the, mm. exactly. The narrative is, should we be doing this at all? And that's mm-hmm. getting that's getting pushed to one side now because we're doing it in a slightly different way. And also, you know, it it, it, it just feels like there's a North Korean dictator running Formula <laughs> One for, for everyone to oh. be sort of... <laughs> just towing the line the way they are as though it's not you know this yeah. is yes this this is brilliant it's it's the equivalent of the this is fine meme isn't it everything yeah it really around is. the puppy and is yeah this is fine like that's oh it's it, it, it's genuinely creepy i it really really made me really uncomfortable <laughs> watching that that commentary and that um you know that uh that feedback towards the weekend when yeah everything i've read for the last few weeks from any fan any commenter uh, you know i'm reiterating a little bit now but anyone who's had anything to say about it seems to have only had negative things to say about it even before it even happened it's like everyone could tell this was going to be a bad idea and now <laughs> it's happened and guess and it what? was it yeah. wasn't a great it wasn't a great thing to see and we're going to have a nice you know normal grand prix weekend next weekend and <laughs> Oh, we it's in Miami. <laughs> well, it's in Miami. It's not really normal. <laughs> it's not really that normal. It, it'll, it'll, it, in terms of structure, it will be yeah. what we're used to seeing, and there'll be breathing space, and there'll be sort of time for the teams to to work on their cars and to 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 think. I think, and I think, like the reason Albon, you mentioned Albon a moment ago. The reason Albon did better in the in the second qualifying session in in the sprint qualifying sprint shootout is because they probably understood the car a little bit better by that point and they were able to set it up properly to give him a chance to qualify where that car should be. Yeah, I mean, there's an element of both sides, isn't there? There's there's that, um, having a better understanding of the car because you've had more running time in it, combined with that that opportunity that it being so fast-paced can bring. Like, I mean, how often in a normal quali session do you see... um, someone that's from one of the, like one of those teams like say a Williams a Haas uh, whatever they sort of they somehow creep into the top 10 with a bit of a blinding lap that's like wow that was impressive and then all the all the mid tier and top tier teams kind of bring out a bit more of the true pace or whatever just just to pull the gap but you haven't got time to mess around like that in the mm-hmm. shootout and that that is the element that I did like to take away from it is the fact that if you can get the car right and get the lap under pressure, you can be rewarded for it to some degree. And I mean, yeah, fair enough. He didn't finish the sprint race in the points. He was just, he fell back a little bit, but that opportunity, it presents that opportunity, I guess. Like there's, I don't want to like, I don't want to kind of crap all over it because I didn't like it in this one scenario. Like I think there is something there, but, it's, I don't know, I think it's just got to be thought about a little bit more rather than deciding that the way you're going to do it four days before the event or whatever it was. Yeah. That's, and yeah, that, that was, and that, that was kind of almost evident in the way that things played out, I think, more and than that, anything. That caused my other big problem. With, and I'm aware we're just complaining a lot here, but like, uh, it, <laughs> it's a thing that needs to be complained about, I, I guess. Um, the other problem with it being such a late decision is that everybody had the standard tyre allocation. So suddenly yeah. they doubled the number of competitive sessions mm-hmm. with the same tyre allocations, which meant that come the Grand Prix, which should have been a two-stopper, the second everybody realised overtaking was difficult, they all just extended out and did a one-stopper. And that's yep. why we had a really dull Grand Prix. Like yeah. They managed to detach the sprint race from the grand prix and yet still manage to have it kind of ruin the grand prix which yeah, is yeah. well it's still intrinsically linked isn't it because they yeah exactly the extra tires they didn't you know if you, if you don't yeah. give them the resources that they need to be able to run these races then this is what's going to happen they're going to have to yeah. take resources away from the main event and mm-hmm. that's absolutely it's, that should not be happening doesn't make any sense it, i i think proper planning going into it would have at least made things slightly better because you wouldn't have stupid scenarios like that. Just give them all an extra set of mediums. That's all it needed. Yeah. yeah. But because but, the decision was made four days in advance of the yeah. event, it's yeah. impossible to achieve. Probably can't be expected to just produce <laughs> all of these tires. Mm. Um, I guess we should talk about the one real 
interesting thing that happened in that sprint race, which was the Russell and Verstappen uh, contact yeah. through turn two on the opening lap. Um, yeah. Even Verstappen, that I thought was fairly innocuous, but yeah, go on. Uh, yeah, I mean, Verstappen made a big deal out of it. I, I mean, it just looked like a lap one racing incident to me. It was, yeah, it was pretty much, it happens all the time there. Like, yeah, it's, it's one of those amb- ambiguities of the rules where had Verstappen ended up in the wall and been taken out of the race, Russell would have potentially been punished because of the outcome of the incident. But because Maybe, but I think Max even- carried on fine, it's, it's gone down the way. It, like, that's just, that, yeah, they- is, that is the way the rules work. The rules are that vague that we, we've discussed it so many times that yeah. the outcome of the incident decides the penalty more penalty. than the actual incident itself yeah. like you could go you could go literally directly wheel to wheel like as in literally you know yeah wheel banging yeah, yeah. like literal wheel banging and if the driver ends up in the wall you'll potentially get a penalty for squeezing him too far if however you both continue like as as expected with like a little bit of a scrape down the wall similar to what happened nothing will come of it because yeah. by the letter of the law you've given them enough racing room but the yeah. the actual incident of contact is still the same it's still someone going in too deep or someone going too far across or someone making a bit of a risky lunge like none of that aspect actually changed it's just that there's 10 centimetres more gap left, I guess, is the only they're not, difference. They're not in the wall, therefore there was racing room. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Which, well, I mean, yeah. by the letter of the way it's written, is correct. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, just, I always find it obscure that, like, that's how we do define yeah. incidents, I guess. Yeah. So this, the whole thing, actually, the way, so the way Verstappen came up at the end of the race and started, started kicking off, called him a D-head and... So I wasn't very happy with Russell. I think that was a bit over the top, but I think the it hilarious was. thing is he was criticising Russell for going up the inside mm. of him and pushing it. <laughs> and then literally turn three, I think, was it turn three? No, so yeah, one, two, three, turn four. He's, Verstappen himself is up the inside of Sainz doing the exact <laughs> same move mm. Russell's just done to him. Yeah. <laughs> so like, it's like the hypocrisy is just hilarious. I think Russell, look, Russell was on the inside in a, in a turn like that especially in if, if you're Max Verstappen and you know you've got an amazing car and DRS, I think he probably would have been better off just backing yeah, out Yeah, just... I don't know yeah. why he had to fight the corner. It was almost petulant the way he tried to fight that corner. I think the corner was gone well before they, they got into the braking zone for turn two because Russell was so far up the inside of him and he oh, knew yeah, it was completely. there. So he knew it was there because he left room for him. Um, yeah, Russell did understeer slightly, but that's the risk. If you're going to try and hang it around the outside of someone that is the risk you're taking, that they may well understeer into you. So, you know, it's not just about your position of your own car, it's your awareness of what might happen with the car on the inside. Absolutely. And I think it's it's that classic Max Verstappen red mist, this car's trying to get by me, I won't let them by, or I need to defend this position at all costs in that, in that you know, in that microsecond. Yeah. His brain just doesn't have that part that goes which is let's just back off a little bit but it's weird because i feel like there's been a couple of times this season especially in australia actually where we actually did see that from him him like actually Mm. sitting back and playing the long game then suddenly turn two of the sprint race and he's like putting it all on the line against a car that he's clearly much faster than yeah a little bit strange um it did lead to one of my highlights of the weekend which was on where have been Sunday morning, I guess it will have been where um, basically ed- the, any teams that need to repair damage to cars from the sprint race for the Grand Prix have to like show an FIA delegate this is the damage, this is the part we want to replace. And it was a picture of um, a Red Bull mechanic and an FIA delegate like looking at uh, the side mm. pod that had the hole in it, and the F- uh, the uh, Red Bull mechanic just had his hand through the hole in the side of the yeah. car like. There's the problem. This is the bit we need to replace. My hand shouldn't be able to be inside the car there. Can we replace this part? <laughs> no, that was good. I like that. <laughs> Should we talk about the race itself? Sure. The actual... The, the race race, there for. The, the race real, race. The Grand Prix. The Grand the real one. Prix. Uh, won by Perez. 
well, Perez won both actually, won the, the sprint and the Grand Prix. Um, obviously, he gained the lead when Verstappen pitted just before the safety car that De Vries called, which meant Perez and Leclerc could pit under the safety car and jump Verstappen. Um, like, it's easy on paper to be like, oh, he got quite lucky there with the safety car, but like, he still had to hold Verstappen off for 38 or so laps. Yeah, and it was. Mo- oh, I was just going to say, he still needed a defense. Oh, like- absolutely. He was, it was when everybody else had then pitted under the safety car. He still worked his way back into third. Yeah. He was literally behind Leclerc, wasn't he? So yeah. also, it would have been, yeah. There was there was plenty of time for that to be defended for. Yeah. So not only that, he was about to overtake Verstappen anyway. Exactly. Yeah. They, well, they, they true. called they called Verstappen into the pits precisely to stop him being overtaken yeah. by Perez because that would upset baby baby Verstappen, wouldn't it? If his teammate goes past him, he'd you kind know, of you don't know what's going to happen in that situation. So they just he kind of forced the it. issue, hadn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Because so like Perez was quicker. Perez was quicker all weekend. Yeah. There's he no doubt was. about that. He he all this talk of. He got lucky, you know, even Christian Horner's been at it. And he, oh, it, it was a bit lucky with the safety cars. No no look about it. It was quicker. It was about to overtake him anyway. Yeah. He, they pitted him. And then, yeah, there was a safety car, which Red Bull probably, I mean, there's no way they could see that coming, I don't think. I think they I think I read be... they had, from, from De Vries' first stop in, they had about 25 seconds to decide whether to pit him that lap or not. So it was it was a very marginal call. You can mm. it was it was obviously the wrong call in hindsight. You can forgive them for making the call. I think it was the riskier call, but I think they were so worried about them crashing into each other into turn one that they yeah. they decided to just go with it. I, and I again, really yeah, if, that's the case. If Perez had been six or seven seconds back at that point, that probably would have left him out for an extra lap to see if the safety yeah. car. But Perez yeah. was yeah. about Forced four issue. tenths behind. Like yeah. Um, yeah. And we've seen Verstappen in turn one at Baku against his teammate before. He went up the, he uh, brake tested um, Danny Ricardo. Oh, I mean that's ago, that's a stretch, mate. That is a, <laughs> that is a big old stretch. <laughs> Still poking how, the bear again. How your calves after stretching them out like that? Come on, that's. <laughs> I think there's a question related to that in the inbox. Actually, I remember rightly. Is there? Okay, we'll get to that. Um, like, I also think if that hadn't been a safety car and they had have carried on at bracing speed, I think there's a good chance Perez would have undercut Verstappen anyway. Yeah, like, no doubt there as well. More Verstappen had just wrecked his tyres by that point and Perez, unsurprisingly, was just cruising along like they were box fresh. Um, yeah, he was he was absolutely the faster of the two of them for most of the weekend. Um He's closed the gap to six points now. He said without the issues he had in Australia, he'd be leading the championship right now, which is fair. Yeah. Like Verstappen won that race. Yeah, Verstappen won that yeah. race and Perez retired. So yeah. yeah it's so long ago. It's like Stick a, a second ago. or third place on Perez. And he's got a, a healthy lead, actually. Um, well, what is it? Is six points at the minute. So. Well, it'd be all the points that he gained in the, uh, what is it, in the sprint race, wouldn't it? Yeah, that's true as well. If, it, um, if they'd been first, second, first, second each and then Perez had done the sprint race it'd be yeah two two points ahead I think no at least four, yeah. po- four points ahead sorry four points ahead um it's so like Christian Horner said he needs to start having weekends like this on non-street tracks now <laughs> which no he said he said proper race circuits oh sorry proper actually. race circuits yeah. oh yeah not these fake ones yeah which I mean I'm kind of with him on that. I'd, I'd like a few more proper circuits. If the, if that's his definition of a proper circuit, I'd like a few more of them on the calendar and a few less. Uh, it's just patronising though, isn't it? And <laughs> like, It is a little bit when you're in Baku. He's, he's your driver. Like, yeah. I mean, the I'm, not even, I'm, not even, I'm not even saying it's acceptable if it's the opposing team's driver, but to come out with a comment like... Yeah, but he can only do it on street circuits, and he was lucky there was a safety car. You would think it was Hamilton that had won or something. Yeah, you yeah. Would. Like the, 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 the comments the coming out of his mouth, it's oh, it's just gross. <laughs> this is why I could never, ever properly back Red Bull because of the way he is these days. There was a time early days when like DC used to trundle around and stick it in the gravel every fortnight or like <laughs> oh this is endearing like look at this but these days I just 
could not properly like I could back a driver like Sergio. I I could bring myself to that. Like if say Lando somehow ended up there, like I could muster that to su continue supporting Lando, but I would never like be able to truly support that team ever while ever he's like that. And that's the I've mentality. Had to do, I've done a lot of mental gymnastics over the years to detach Red Bull drivers from Red Bull as a team and they support them separately. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's, there's so many good drivers though that, Oh yeah, you fall can't victim to it. We talked about it so many times. Like, and it is really easy to support the drivers when you think about it, because some of the better drivers on the grid that have really good fan bases, or had, because he's one of them's not there anymore. But it is like people like Ricardo Perez has got a re uh, Perez has still got a really good fan base. Huge. Uh, Science has a really good fan base. Like, irrespective of the fact that they've had to go through the Red Bull system to get to where they are, they have their own fans that basically once Red Bull are done with them, the fans will move along. But I don't think Red Bull really care about that, do they? They just care Not about in the, the numbers of the titles. They don't care who's... Well, actually, they do care who brings them in. They I do suppose. care who brings them yeah. in very much. But yeah. it has to be the right driver for Red Bull. The yeah. Winning the title is not enough for Red Bull. It has to be the driver they want to win the title, which, yeah. which I find strange. I think just let them race, especially this season. If it get, It would be really sad. It would be a real shame if they did start doing things to properly disadvantage um, Perez later on and, you know, if, if it swings too far towards Verstappen because they really ought to have... It's just... It's between those two, I think, this year. Right now, it looks like it's between those two. Yeah, so. oh, definitely. Yeah. Do you think uh, Do you think this is a the start of a proper championship push from Perez? Do you think he's got it in him right now? Well, I mean, we talked about it briefly before the this run of races and, like, I remember saying that these are the races where he needs to turn it over, where you've got, like, Baku we've just had, Miami coming up, which is a street circuit or a car park circuit, whatever you want to call that. Um, Formula E you circuit. Got, <laughs> yeah, you got Monaco coming up, and then in between all that, you've got um, Emilia Romagna, which is, like, it's not a street circuit, but it's still quite narrow, and yeah. it makes it more difficult to overtake. So there's, there's definitely elements of that kind of vibe, but... That that's like a good run of four races for for Checo, in my opinion. That he could potentially come out of leading the title, and I would kind of love to see how Red Bull deal with that as a whole. To be brutally <laughs> honest with you, I would too. I really hope mm. we get to see it. Yeah, I mean, it, what would be really interesting is if that did happen, and then suddenly a couple of other teams caught up and were in the mix for wins. Then you'd have then yeah. you know. I mean, the, the more these two take points out of each other, really, the better it is for the championship and for all the other teams. Because if someone does, you know, develop into into the mix, then they might with, be in with a fighting chance of being being a factor, you know, towards I mean, the end yeah. of the season. If, if, Red, especially Red Bull, if Red Bull aren't going to be developing as much as usual. So Yeah, that's what I'm going to say. Red Bull are going to run out of CFD and win tunnel time before everybody else. So, you know, the, the pack are going to catch up. Whether it's quickly enough, probably not. There's a lot of races, though. There's a heck of a lot mm -hmm. of races. We're, there only, is. we're not even a quarter of the way into the season. We're in we're May, four. we're not even a quarter of the way into the season. It's true. We've done four. Yeah. That's Should we crap. talk about some other teams? <laughs> Quick maths. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ferrari. It kind of looked like Ferrari found some pace, but I suspect it was mostly just Leclerc's really good at this track when he's not crashing. <laughs> Because he managed to sort of do both this weekend, didn't he? Yeah, I was about to say, he did crash though, <laughs> um, to some degree. He was he was pole for the sprint and the Grand Prix by almost two tenths um, over the nearest Red Bull both times. Obviously didn't have the race pace for them, but, um, but he managed second in the sprint. Obviously Verstappen was a bit wounded. And then third in the Grand Prix ahead of both the Mercedes and Aston Martins who have been generally faster than them for the previous three races. Um, like Frederick Vasseur kind of downplayed it. He said they have brought some up dates. They've made a sort of a big important choice in terms of their technical direction that is paying off, but they're still not where they expect it to be. Um, they he also said like a B car, a proper B spec car, was never on their radar. They just 
are understanding where the car is and bring in small updates so they feel like they go in the right direction um it's kind of hard not to see the eight tenth gap between the two ferraris in qualifying though it was like night yeah. and day between the two drivers signs kind of also ran didn't he 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 wasn't really anywhere oh they did manage to hold hamilton off for the entire race which was yeah good going i mean there's a bit of a sort of obviously very difficult to overtake suddenly at baku <laughs> weirdly um yeah and difficult to follow i think as well nowadays like again like it comes back to the changes that they've made to the cars this year and i think now it's very clear that it is a lot harder to follow than it yeah. was last year. So they absolutely need to update the regulations and do something about that because you can't, the whole purpose of the regulations was to make it easier for cars to follow so they could race better. And if we're getting, you know, if we're at a circuit that's got probably the longest straight, maybe the longest straight on the calendar or one of the longest effective straights on the calendar. I say, I guess it depends where you count it as yeah. being straight <laughs> yeah. from, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> flat out, it from it's like, flat out sections, definitely. The longest flat out, yeah, probably. Yeah, I mean, it is. Fl- even even following, it's flat out. So if they can't get close enough through that final corner before the flat out section to get an yeah. overtake done down here, then there's something gone badly wrong with these regulations because, like I say, the whole point was to so they could point. get through corners close to each other so they could mount an attack ideally without DRS and we're a long way from there aren't we right now but then they also yeah. shortened the DRS zone for this year's race yeah. obviously yeah. overcorrected with that so yeah bit of a just bit weird of a miscalculation there. there I think Very I think that so. combined with I think the changes to the regs by leaving the DRS alone would have probably actually played out alright in the long run but the you've got the you've got the problem with you've got the changes to the regs which have made it a little bit more difficult to follow as we've just been mentioning there and then also shortening the DRS so and just kind of made DRS a little bit pointless I mean there were some teams struggle more than others definitely but yeah. it I sort mean, of made it a little suffer. bit pointless Red, Red Bull were just fine with <laughs> with that length of DRS I think you could have made you don't, you don't need DRS years. when you're first and second though <laughs> do you really well no you had to care this, <laughs> Perez had to Verstappen had to overtake Leclerc didn't he and he well, as soon as he opened yeah. DRS Leclerc was just a sitting duck like, yeah. there was absolutely no defence you could possibly mount because the the DRS is so effective on the Red Bull. So oh, they, they've overcorrected because they were worried about the Red Bulls being able to overtake too easily. But by doing that, they've made it literally impossible for anyone else <laughs> for anyone to else. overtake using DRS. So it, then, yeah. then then, we're into the realms of, well, what's the point in DRS then? <laughs> Why are we going to have it if it's not going to be, if we're not going to give them the space to use it other than yeah. Red Bull? So, yeah. Uh, so I'm going to keep that. us moving because we've got a lot to cover. Uh, quick word on Aston Martin um, seemed a lot close between them and the Ferraris and Mercedes do we think that is the gap closing track specific I mean between them and Merck I would say track specific because it's about your power unit isn't it and they've mm. got the same thing in the back yeah, that's true so I'd, I kind of expect them to be a little bit closer because of that be interested to see somewhere that's less flat out because they were they were very close in terms of overtakes, weren't they? Um, in terms of they were, it was it was a literal drag down that start finish straight when it was a Merck versus an Aston. Yeah. So um, there was some really good so racing between others. them, actually. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, Merck, I think Merck have been uh, sorry, Aston have been fighting um, DRS issues all weekend, actually, as well. They actually, yeah, yeah. a lot of qualifying they didn't have DRS for past yeah. qualifying. They were having to tow each other to to get as much of an effect of DRS as they possibly could because, and they were working properly together as a team. The teamwork between yeah. those two all weekend was unbelievable. Amazing. This is yeah. Like in the nice race when Stroll was like, tell Fernando I'm not going to try and overtake him, just look ahead of you. And then Alonso was like giving recommended like brake bias adjustments <laughs> and stuff. Like <laughs> It's kind of amazing. It's like, it's such a different Alonso to what we <laughs> used to as well. I think, you know, I think like they both know that they've they have got a very good car this year and they for the for the sake of the team they need to maximize it yeah yeah That's absolutely the thing and i think the the best way of them doing that is by working very very closely together yeah. as a team even on track in, in, in that way i think that's going to deliver they both know what their job is 
in yeah. that team. Then they're, they're not mm-hmm. fighting for world championships. They're just getting that team up to the very best position it could be, and, and they're sacrificing their own championships or their own positions against each other at least to achieve that. And being, you know, being flexible in terms of like what they're willing to do on the track to maximize that result for the team, which is a good thing. Yeah, yeah I was. I was about to say something very, very similar. Of like, they're aware that they're essentially fighting to secure like third and fourth in the drivers and a potentially second place constructors. That's that's kind of where they're at right now. They need to do what they can to stay ahead and maintain the advantage that they have over the Ferrari and the Merc over the first few races. And I mean, it's something you don't normally get in Formula and his teammates being no. that helpful to each other. But, but they both know that for the long run, that is the way to do it. I mean, Alonso's Wiley. He knows, he knows the the curse he can put on a team by um, being very um, anti teammate. Let's yeah. say so. Maybe he's finally learned from his ways, in that he needs to help bring Stroll with him if he wants to maintain a good car at Aston. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the thing. He knows that if he if he's going to continue to have a good car, that team's going to need need some money, and in order to yeah. get. And, and to keep that team going, they're going to need a bit. Probably, the, I mean, they've got Lawrence Stroll and Mega Bucks behind them, but still, it helps to be winning. Oh, definitely, and yeah. Finishing higher up in the order, so the more they can do that, the more resource the team can have to give him the equipment that he he wants. So, yeah, yeah it's very important, I think, for that team to finish as highly as possible this season in the championship. And, and as drivers, like personally finishing third, fourth, fifth, whatever in the championship, kind of unimportant. But if you can sacrifice that to make sure the team finishes second. That's yeah, and like give you a chance priceless. to finish better next season. They know they're not going to yeah. win championships this season. Exactly. So yeah. why not? Why not do it this way and then focus everything, all your efforts into next season, and then maybe you might be in a position where they're actually fighting the Red Bulls next year. You know, they might even be in a position yeah. where they're fighting Red Bulls at the end of the year. Then all this could change. <laughs> yeah. Then the relationship breaks down completely when they're yeah. fighting yeah. for a win. <laughs> Um, yeah. You know, we, we haven't seen all of the updates come through yet. We've obviously had a few teams bring quite big updates to Baku. Um, once we get to, I think, Spain, there's going to be, a, well, uh, Imola, sorry, there's going to be another raft of updates. Yeah. Maybe a load more yeah. for Spain. So I think it won't be until Spain that we really know how things are going to properly pan out this season. This is, you know, we're still in that sort of baby stage, first quarter of, yes, right now it looks like Red Bull are going to wreck the joint. But, you know, I think given some of the steps forward that we've seen already from some of the teams like McLaren, McLaren had a really, really good, they, had a, they looked to have a decent car. Norris performed very yeah. well in qualifying, both qualifying floor, sessions. Floor update for Norris, wasn't it, I think? Yeah, so... The most know, significant thing. You can yeah. see that like there are big steps still to come with these cars. And again, that's another one of these things that that's got Christian Horner even saying, you know, we're looking over our shoulder. We need to make hay while the sun shines because it's possible that other teams could update their cars and bring heaps and heaps and heaps of performance where Red Bull have kind of maximized already what they've got. So they just don't have the time, the wind tunnel time to do it or or the wind tunnel time to, to achieve it. Yeah. So it's, it is make no mistake. It is going to be very difficult for Red Bull to develop that car to its full potential. Yeah. As fast as the other teams. So I think, I'm quietly confident, actually. We're not quietly confident, but I have faith that not all is lost for every team this season. I think there is still a chance that people could bring themselves into the fight and and be a threat, maybe even for the championship by the end of the season. I don't. I think it'd be silly to write Ferrari or Mercedes off, or even Aston off at this point. The, yeah, it's. I think. If if we're gonna get anything in terms of excitement in the championship fight, it's gonna be like the summer two thousand and nine when Braun won everything in the first half of the season, and then everybody caught them up and just kind mm. of chipped away at their points lead and didn't do it fast enough. I think if we're gonna get anything, it's gonna be that. But yeah, I don't know. We'll see. I, I live in yeah. hope. Yeah, it is. It is very much a faith thing and not an expectation. It's yeah, exactly. Not the expectation, but uh, all hope isn't lost. Is what I'm trying to say. Like it, mm-hmm. there's there is a chance. There's there's an outside chance that people could bring it back still. So yeah. 
Uh, one you already mentioned McLaren and their new uh, floor upgrade. Uh, Norris said that basically brought them back up to where they should have been at the start of the season. Uh, although it only really brought small gains in Baku, it's going to be better off in Miami where there's more sort of mm. medium speed corners. So good signs for McLaren, moving in the right direction. Um, and again, it, it shows you what kind of a step a team can bring. This is why mm-hmm. I'm saying what I'm saying, you know, like it, yeah, absolutely. the gains are there to be had. Um, and I mean, Piastri did well to even make it through the weekend. He was really ill in the lead up. Um, yeah. I think he said he something like, like he was, he had like two slices of toast all yeah. week or something. Yeah. All yeah. weekend. Grim. Savage. Yeah. It must've been awful that. Um, I want to quickly talk about Nick De Vries cause there's already, we're four races in now and there's a lot of articles on the internet already talking about him. Um, I think the weekend he had is obviously sped this along a bit um so he crashed in qualifying he was slowest in sprint qualifying had a collision with his teammate in the sprint crashed out of the grand prix um it's been a pretty torrid start to the season for him um he's also in the slowest car on the whole grid though he is but then you look at what yuki sonoda's doing in that car I don't yeah, know. Yuki, that, Yuki that, has had a, got a year's legs on him, though, hasn't he? He's been he in, does. And yeah. I just, I just think that easiest. those points he scored for Williams back in Monza seem a very long time ago right now. They do right now, but, you know, they, they've got to develop that car. They've got to make it better. They've got all kinds of sh- stuff going mm. on in that team that's, that's making things difficult, I think, probably for the drivers. I think... Sonoda's, you know, got a year under his belt. He's, he's a lot more comfortable. He's had the guidance of Pierre Gasly the entire time he was at mm-hmm. um, Alpha Tauri. And, yeah, I think it's unfair to four races in to dismiss a rookie like this. I know it's the Red Bull family and it's the Red Bull way, but they've brought him in from outside the Red Bull family. So I think he needs a, probably a little bit more time to, to shine. He, he certainly needs, you know, a bit more development in the car to to allow him to do that yeah Yeah. it's i think the thing that disappoints me most about it though is when he's at a circuit like this like if there was in theory anywhere that would suit someone that's been racing in (laughs) formula e for the last three years this is the kind of circuit that would and (laughs) close walls and 90 degree corners yeah there's a lot like there's a lot of it that is essentially kind of clumsy understeering or whatever and judgment with walls and that's what's disappointing me personally i mean like i agree with you Stu. it's it's early doors and and whatever but i think what i will always take into account is that it's he's been around a long time he's not like a he's not like a true rookie of sorts like someone like logan Sargent is has not competed at this level whatsoever until this season. Nick De Vries has had practice sessions, even race sessions. He's been in what is quite an aggressive Formula E series. I mean, <laughs> yeah, the cars are very different, but in terms of close quarters combat and walls either side of you, like he's well versed in that sort of stuff. And he's raced places like this in kind of F2 and F3 for a long time as well. So mm, I think yeah. that... I'd, basically, I've got, I've got more, let's call it leniency, I guess, with Logan Sargent making mistakes than I have with Nick De Vries making mistake, making mistakes. But I would also say talk of getting rid of him from the team is way too soon after four races. Yeah, I mean, if you look back at Shit Schumacher this time last year, it split two cars in half, and no one was talking about it. <laughs> exactly. Well, they, <laughs> I mean, they so. were, but <laughs> <laughs> he I'm lasted gonna... an entire season after that. So I think, yeah, I think exactly. Nick De like, be fine. <laughs> Talk of getting rid of him is a little premature, but I I can understand. Like, I mean, I'm disappointed. I I thought I'd see a lot more from him. Um, so like, from that aspect, I can sort of see it. But yeah, get, getting getting rid of someone four races in is a little extreme. Oh yeah, I just think when you when you're he is a rookie, you know, like he is because Formula One is such a humongous step up from Formula E and Formula Two that it is it's you know it's an the magnet, the orders of magnitude between all three of those series are absolutely huge, mm-hmm. and 
I think just because you've done close quarters racing in other formula, it's a lot easier to race close quarters at slower speeds and, and Agreed. in cars that are a lot less on the edge than a Formula One car. I think this particular Formula One car is probably a bit more on the edge than maybe most of the other Formula One cars <laughs> on the grid as well. So <laughs> to be a rookie, and he is a rookie, in that in that position, I think is a very, very difficult position to be in. So I yeah. don't think it's fair at all to... to to be too critical of him um even though he has won you know he's won yeah he's won a world championship with with formula e but yeah he's he, he there's there's obviously a lot of work to do from his side of the garage still to get him used to that car and to get that car into a place where it's it's usable for him i think that's the issue i think there's probably yeah. a fair few yeah. drivability issues with that car if it's lacking downforce well i don't disagree with any of that i'm going to say right now I don't think he gets a second season at Alpha Terry. I think I'm happy to make that call already. Four race, four Genuinely. Races and again, I think it's, if he was with a different team, I might not think that. But yeah, it's the team is being with in the, the Red Bull program, knowing how many drivers they've got. That, like, if you watch, was it, I can't remember it was F2 or F3 I was watching recently, and literally like a third of the grid has got a Red Bull livery. Yeah. Like, the amount of young drivers I've got coming up, I just can't yeah, see a world in which he keeps do, that seat. Yeah. They got three or four, I think, in in Formula, Formula yeah. Two. Yeah. Um, speaking of Formula Two, Oliver, just really quickly, Oliver Behrman, the British yeah, driver, he's like come yeah. to life. Yeah, speaking of drivers that like Baku, yeah, a star is born <laughs> in Baku here. Like he won the the F two sprint and the F two feature race, um, qualified on pole for the feature race as well. Yeah, amazing, amazing. Well done, Oliver Behrman. Um, keep Path. your eye on him. Part of the Ferrari Driver Academy, if I remember right. Yes, he is. Yes, yeah, yeah. Currently. So watch out, science. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All the now, don't don't be silly. It. Ferrari don't promote junior drivers. They ship them off somewhere else to be forgotten. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> watch out, Hulkenberg. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, and then the last like big thing from the Grand Prix to talk about, I guess, is the pit lane on the final lap. Um, when Ocon came in, the end of the penultimate lap because obviously he was he did the whole race on hard tyres he was holding out for a late safety car which never came so he had to pit on the penultimate lap everyone knew he was going to except apparently the FIA representatives in charge of Park Ferme who had started putting a barrier across the entry to the pit lane um, and we were allowing media and various other personnel to spill into the pit lane it's the stupidest thing I've did, ever seen in my entire life it looked like have Group something... B rallying didn't we have something vaguely similar to this one year when Albon did one of his yeah, was it last minute pits? Imola? I want to mm. say it was Imola last year and he did we, the same thing. We've referenced this race before we and have, got it and wrong between both of us, Chris. Constantly so. get it wrong. I'm pretty it's sure I'm right before. This <laughs> yes. Um, I mean, it's just inexcusable, isn't it? Like, yeah. I don't know if you. So, so I wasn't watching on Sky, but I've seen a clip since of it happening on sky and they were talking to ted in the pit lane at the time and he was watching it unfold in real time just saying there's people in the pit lane why, why are they there mm. ocon's about to come in everyone like he was getting really yeah. panicked because he was this, obviously this thought he might be this about yeah, 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 yeah about to watch something awful happen and it's just like it, we literally had the the stewards calling the fia to um an investigation after the race which it's always a sign that something's gone very wrong. Bizarre. Yeah, so um, bizarre, completely inexcusable. And I've seen people be like, oh, it was obviously an honest mistake and it's an easy thing to what? not have happen again. But as you say, Tom, it already has happened before. Yep. Not quite this badly, but like... But also, how the hell does it even happen in the first place? Just wait anybody, until the checkered flag and then do it. Yeah. Then let people out. That's all you have to do. It's At simple. the very least, wait for the last car to pass the pit entry to start their last lap before you start doing it. Like, uh, yeah. Here's a thought, though. I thought everyone went back into the pits. Of par- oh, is it? it no, it's, it's, this is the bit between where everybody's parked up for Park Fermi and the rest of the pit lane, so isn't they, it? They, uh, what, I'm, what I'm thinking in my head is everyone's got to go in there anyway, so they, know, they should be expecting cars even after the checkered flag so- because... Everyone's got to arrive for Park Fermi. So they 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 arrive in different 
points for Park Ferme along pit lanes. So like say in Silverstone, it's before all of the garages. Yeah. But I think there's certain ones where you go past, there must be certain ones where you go past all the garages and Park Ferme is up at the top of the pit lane rather than... I suppose it depends where the podium is as well, doesn't it? It's like yeah. there's all intricacies Cause, yeah, to cause it. Yeah, because they like, because then they'll let certain cars through because if the podium's at the other end, then you might mm. have all the cars stopping for Park Ferme and then you'll occasionally yep. see like a car driving through the pit lane to get to the number mm-hmm. one board and the number two and three board. So it's... It's not as straightforward as sort of, you know, everyone just queue up kind of thing and don't let people go through. But none of that matters because the race is still live anyway. Yeah, <laughs> so that's like, what I mean. Why the like, hell are they even letting people? Yeah. <laughs> it is still a live racetrack and the pit yeah. lane is part of that. Yeah. It's Bizarre. Bonkers. Um, yeah. Very lucky. I, that I will, you know what, nothing- like... When you hear Ben Sormian talking about ear studs and, and oh. jewellery and things like that, and then stuff like this happens, it's just like, dude, get your house in order before you start worrying about all that stuff. Like, yeah, seriously. Ridiculous. I won't, I, I can't remember, it was the old, the, the guy who used to work for Aston I was Martin, literally just trying to find it. Um, Matt he Bishop, Matt Bishop, who used yeah, yeah. to be the sort of um, communications yeah, guy at Aston Martin. Yeah, very good yeah. Twitter account, by the way. His, if yeah. You, if you're looking for someone to follow, is very, very good. Um, yeah, he tweeted it, and he hit the nail on the head. Like, you can't um, be imposing these kind of, like, nitpicking sanctions on drivers when you can't even run an event safely. Like, it's yep. just ridiculous. I'm Absolutely. trying to find the exact tweet, and he was tweeting a lot about the snooker, it seems. Oh, the snooker <laughs> yeah. was so good. The snooker was better than Snook- the Formula 1 this week. snooker was definitely amazing. better than the Grand Prix. Did you watch yeah. it? Uh, bits of it. Oh my god, it was amazing. Yes, so Matt Bishop, he tweeted, message to Mohammed Ben Salalam, we'll have absolutely no more foot- footling nonsense from you about trivia such as Lewis Hamilton's no studs till you've got the FIA's race safety house in order. End of. Mm-hmm. Which is mm-hmm. Couldn't have fantastic. put it back myself. Yeah. I tried to put it in the same way. I didn't do it justice. So thanks <laughs> for reading the tweet. Right. Driver of the day. Perez. Perez, easy. <laughs> I'm going to say, move on. I'm already outvoted, <laughs> but I'm, sh- I'm, I'm shouting out Yuki Sonoda. Um, cool. Qualified at eighth. He pitted before the safety car, so lost out. Still fought back to 10th in what is arguably the worst car on the grid. I think Sonoda is having a very good season in a very bad car. I think he's every race now he's finished 10th or 11th, which is pretty good consistency. In the slowest car, yeah. that is amazing. Yeah. I don't know. I don't think he'd had points yet because it was ele- I think he'd been in 11th and 12th basically on a couple of occasions that me and you had him around there in his predictions yeah. for that reason he might, was he, last race he got 10th didn't he oh no maybe he'd got a point I don't know the average yeah, is about did. 11th yeah. so yeah he's, he's always been there or thereabouts he's always been on the cusp so there is that but Perez yeah I'm happy to say it is Perez but I just wanted to <laughs> give my shout out to Snowder because I think he is quietly having a very very good season uh, move of the day slash weekend maybe Alonso inside of turn four on Sainz that was extremely good is that on your list let me look at the list that is on the list it is on the list I got it yeah. all right as well turn like, four Sainz I've, I've yes. seen passes there in Formula 2 <laughs> and 3 before I don't know if I've ever seen an F1 move into that corner it's extremely good <sighs> no you tested um, I thought so the first lap of the sprint, I thought Russell's eventual move on Verstappen into turn three was very good. After they'd initially made contact in turn two, the actual overtake into turn three was pretty good. Yeah. Um, Stroll had a good one on Albon in the sprint as well, like a really late dive to the inside of turn one. Um, trying to remember that one. I think I remember the one. But again, we're dancing around the fact that I think we're all in agreement that uh, it was that Alonso and Sainz one, wasn't it? Nice. Yeah, I think so. Easy. Easy. And then final award. Honestly, what the f- are we doing here? I feel like this is already pre-decided and we've already talked about it and it's the pit lane at the end. <laughs> of course it is. Uh, I mean, yeah. Be, when it's that I much see, of a you've got shambles. Castle, Castle Cam written down there. That yeah, we can't mm. not the mention the fact that Castle Cam is back. Stupid, pointless, irritating shot. Like, here's and again, a microsecond they... of a Formula 1 car going by. Here's a wall for three seconds. Here's another <laughs> microsecond of a, the same for the one guy going by a little bit further up the track. And again, if what? they did it <laughs> once, 
just as like, here's a cool thing, fine. But they just kept cutting back to it and it was exactly the same shot. The guy time. must have put, done, put more sucked. steps in that day than I did. Like, oh, honestly. <laughs> like... You can tell from the other camera moves as well. He's just waiting for someone in his ear to say, okay, go now. Like sprint, 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 sprint. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it is, it is the, the pit lane nonsense at the end without yeah. a shadow of a doubt. Anything else from the race that you wanted to mention? I mean, Alpine had an absolutely awful weekend, but uh, mm. not the first time we've said that this season. Should we yeah. move on and do predictions? No, I, don't think, I, can... I literally don't think there's much else to say about this. It was yeah. dull, the, the wasn't it? It was really this, dull. The sooner get this this podcast out of the way, the better. <laughs> well, yeah, we've we've got we've, we've got another interesting car park circuit to talk about. So Yay! I'm going to keep calling it a car park circuit because that is what it is. Let's um, just right, blitz but, through to the um, inbox because there's some actually more interesting stuff in there. Yeah. Well, I'll I'll rattle Preds. We can do Preds for Miami, the car park race. And then, yeah, we'll get to inbox. All yeah, sounds like a plan. Let's do it. Let's go. Right. Preds. Pointless, pretty much, for us. Chris got a solitary point for Perez. I didn't even make any predictions. So. Exactly. <laughs> that, that you didn't that can't, ex- can't expect points when you don't even join in, Stu. Mm. <laughs> um, in terms of the weekend overall, um, we had two people tied on three points for this weekend, being the top scorers, Paige Henderson and Brendan Lalor. I hope I'm saying that surname right. Um, both had... Uh, Charlie and Checo, fastest qualifier and winner, respectively. Uh, Paige had 18 finishes and Brendan had random driver, Yuki Snowder, in 10th. So that's where the, those points went. Um, a lot of people scoring, though, generally. So that's good for most people. Some points were <laughs> some points <laughs> went places other than us. Um, in terms of the table, that has Jeremy Simkin at the top on 10 points. We have... Um, then a whole bunch of people that I can't name who are tied behind that. Um, too many to name, but it's all still very tight at the top. Like three, four points cover the top hundred people, maybe. So I mean, we're early in the season, but that's still pretty good. That's still pretty good. Um, in terms of F one fantasy, I will say well done to Armenia with extra A's. Um, four hundred twenty eight points winning for this week. And then in terms of the overall standings, that means that the Spinquisition are still at the top with uh, 1,351. So congratulations to you for maintaining that. And then very quickly for our grid rival spot, um, this week's winner was Aria Zimus with 1,048 points. Uh, but the top three remain the same. Effortlessly, Fester F1 and Stroll Down Vettel Avenue are the top three. There. So good. Rattled. Back of the grid.com. Want to get involved? Links. Click it. Cool. Uh, Storylines for the car park. Okay. Storylines for this week. Um, who will bring, will anyone bring up grades and will they shuffle up the order in any way? No. I, I, it no. seemed like this <laughs> week some of the upgrades did like make a difference and move people around a little bit because the midfield from literally Aston Martin to Haas is so close that. <laughs> You know, even the smallest upgrade can make a difference. So it'll be interesting to see if anyone brings any big components to Miami. Um, obviously, Perez, next storyline, Perez, can he continue the good run of form on what should be classed as a street circuit? Is Ish. it? Is kind it? It's a car park circuit. It's kind of a street it's circuit. An, yeah. kind of a street it's circuit. not the a proper, it's not a proper racetrack, as Christian Horner would call it. So... Well, mm. I mean, is it a proper racetrack? Is it not a proper racetrack? Who knows? But w- the, the real question is, will Perez be as quick there as he has been at I mean, any other non, tr- <laughs> not real racetracks? They've got actual water in the marina this year, so oh, do they? I don't no. know if that makes it. Yeah, it's a car park with a puddle now. It's just a, it's just a, it's just a well, big it's just above a ground big swimming pool. pool. It's just a big swimming pool. <laughs> strange. Um, Very strange. Speaking of strangeness, I'll do one more storyline for Miami. We'll just do three. How weird will it be this year? <laughs> Last yeah. year, it was uh, something. <laughs> so yeah, I'm Again, excited for this one. Another thing that we will come back to in the inbox, and there's clearly stuff that we don't know about yet, and I'm concerned. <laughs> but should we do some predictions? Let's. I mean, yeah, let's let's attempt. Um, I mean, I'll just I'm going to put it out there, right? just to make life easier for everyone and get this over and done with. 
Uh, I'm gonna go Perez Perez. I'm I'm just putting it out there. I'm doing it. Um, sorry, Checo fans. I've just ruined your entire you Miami have. weekend. But Perez Perez, Chris, care to take a shot at the double? Oh, we're doing we're doing two in one now. Um, unless, unless you two want to go tit for tat. That's no, I'll, fine. I'll I'll do I'll do a double prediction. I'm gonna say I'm gonna be boring and stay Verstappen for the win. Okay. I'm going to be interesting and say Alonso for fastest in Q3. Ooh. Okay. How about you, Stu? I'm going to go Leclerc fastest in Q3, and I'm going to go mm. with my head and say <laughs> Verstappen for the win. Okay. I like there's a nice mix there. Hmm. I like My that. heart says Perez, but my head says Verstappen. Okay. First DNF. Uh, I'm sorry to draw on you after you've just done that, Stu, but I'm going to go reverse this time for first DNF. Nick DeVries. I mean, yeah. Chris? I'm going to go for the cruelest possible choice and say Logan Sargent. Oh. Ah. Okay. See, this is the thing about Chris, right? He's a lovely person <laughs> on the outside, but he's got a heart of darkness. <laughs> he stick the knife in when you least expect it. Exterior, yeah. <laughs> I, w- I will point out for you, Chris that this has never worked for me. I do it all the time and it never works for me. Um, it, it, having having said that, I am going to say the same thing as you say, like a sergeant, because <laughs> it's just my thing. Home race. Why not? You, um, you cruel, cruel men. Aren't we just? Uh, Chris, number of finishes, please. I'm going to go, I'm going to go high this week. I'm going to say 18. 18. Okay. Stu? 17. Oh, this makes it a difficult life for me. <laughs> I, I want to be optimistic, but you two have taken the realistic, optimistic options. Do you know what? I'm going to say 19. I'm just going to do it. I'm going to go wow, out there. Very Sar- Sergeant, Sergeant's the only one. Right, Chris, draw as draw us even a random driver. Random driver this week four. is George Russell. Ooh. Ooh. That's really tough. Oh, I feel so like every week we go, oh, that's really tough. There's, there's not an easy one. Oh, no, there's nah, maybe one easy one on there. Sixth. I'm called. That's mine. I'm in. Sixth. I'm, I'm letting you decide between you. I'm letting one of you pull the trigger. I'm going to go seventh. Okay. I sort of slow, I had a bit of slowdown as I was saying that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So I'm going to say, ah, oh, they sent, one of those sounds right. Who am I going to copy? <laughs> Sorry, I've just said a comment in Discord that I cannot repeat. All I'll say is, it, it, <laughs> it, it's a reference to, it's a reference to Max Verstappen's comments mm. after oh, the, is that the spring what it race. Is? And I thought they were just being funny. like, really me. <laughs> like, no, I was like, that's not like on. people in our Discord to be that cruel. <laughs> that I'm going to say sixth comment. as well. Oh, I was a, I was a interestingly similar in places. I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> then again, you scored more points than me last week, so bring it on. Cool. Bring it on. Right, and as I said earlier, head to backofthegrid.com if you want to get involved. All new players welcome. Always worth doing. There's a prize if you get five out of five. Go there. Thanks. Links in the description below. Yeah, mate. <laughs> Set like and subscribe, the click the bell icon for notifications, all that. Yeah. Smash all that, that like button. God. Yeah. yeah. Got, Did got you the... know 53% of you are not subscribed? <laughs> all that... the big hitters have been... Do all those things. Leave a review. Five um, stars really okay, helps. Okay, let, let's... Come on. <laughs> Before we Busy, do the inbox... Busiest episode, can I just say it? And we, that's the most know, we've ever done of that stuff. Nonsense. Very quickly before the inbox, I just want to have a quick word on F1 Academy, which started over the weekend. You may not know it started over the weekend because <laughs> it was impossible to watch. It literally mm. wasn't broadcast anywhere. Um, there's now a highlights video on the F1 YouTube page of the three races. It was properly filmed. They had a full suite of cameras. There's a commentator. It's baffling that they had everything there and then didn't broadcast it. So from from I what don't... I have heard, it sounds like there's some weirdness going on around contracts and rights and stuff yeah. that is standing issue. in the way of it being broadcast properly unfortunately 
Um, but hopefully it'll be resolved soon. And we'll hopefully they'll be resolved for the next race. Yeah. Because there was some pretty, from the the short highlights video, there was some pretty good racing in there. There were there were exciting races. Um, Marta Garcia won the two um, full length races, and Amna Al Kabasi won the sprint race. Um, also worth mentioning, um, Abby Pulling who. I believe she qualified pole for at least one of the races, but um, that team got completely excluded from qualifying for having a part on the car that wasn't supposed to be on. It was something weird like... are they like spec cars? So it was something weird like every other F4 series is allowed this certain part, but for some reason F1 Academy, they're not allowed it and they forgot to take it off or something weird like that. But she, oh, they're sharing she, cars with like another series now or something? Well, no, I think they've just got the spec car. But within the rules for F1 Academy, they're supposed to remove this certain oh. component or so. It's, it's weird. But she still recovered from the back to finish like fourth or fifth in all the races. Um, I think she's still going to be the driver to beat. Um, but yeah, as we say, hopefully by the next race, it will actually be watchable. Go watch the um, the highlights on YouTube. Throw lots of love at that series because for all of our criticism of the way a lot of this women in motorsport stuff has been done we all ultimately really want it to succeed so please mm-hmm. do go go watch it and give it some love agreed cool right let's do some inbox jingle i, agree. I also agree <laughs> <laughs> jingle Uh, shall I take the first one? Um, Go for Mick it. Sure. says, hey man, regardless of whether it's currently legal, should drivers be able to overtake in the pit lane? It seems extremely unsafe and an accident waiting to happen. It is weird that, because I, this, I guess, is in reference to when Russell and Stroll, I think, went into the... Oh, that was it. was in the safe car, wasn't it? Stroll tried to back up to give them a bit more double stack time. So Russell just overtook him in the pit entry and then they went side by side down the pit lane. It does seem weird that that's allowed, doesn't it? Um, yeah, I, I mean, guess. It's not strict. So I have a bit of an issue here. So it's not strictly overtaking in the pit lane. It was overtaking because you, you can't. It's, it shouldn't be possible because you're both running at the yeah. pit lane speed yeah. limit. So it's impossible to overtake because the, 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 the floor of the speed limit is so low that, yeah, like it, it yeah. shouldn't be possible. Um the issue is two cars running side by side and the pit lane's wide enough for two cars to be side by side in the pit lane. Mm. So I don't really have a problem with it. it, it, it as, so long as the the car on the inside has the pit, his garage is before well, the yeah. driver on the outside. Yeah. Because then if you want to get into your garage, you're going to have to have a break and then are you getting in trouble for him? Is the driver on the inside going to be in trouble for impeding the other car? Probably not because the other car would have, have to had to have been going slow for the chasing car to have drawn level. So for me, I, I don't really have a problem with it. It's The pit lane is designed to fit two cars to make that into something that's possible. So uh, it, it's a, pit lanes are they're, they're dangerous environments. Everyone knows how dangerous they are and everyone is on, other than apparently during the last lap of the race, everyone is... <laughs> on high alert through the entire race because any car could come in into that pit lane at any time so i don't really have a problem with it but i can see why it looks sketchy Mm. i think a track like this it's a lot more viable i hope no one tries it as zandvoort or monaco (laughs) yeah i think i think there's probably elements of this that are maybe covered in driver pre-weekend briefings that yeah, you just don't true. see on yeah. tv anyway so like there's probably is quite possibly something said which is you know this pit lane is wide enough to run side by side if it happens it happens but be it on you if you know you end up sandwiched and you can't get to your pit box because of it like there, there will be a discussion of it because i'm pretty sure we've sort of seen it when you get those like behind the scenes looks into it on sort of drive to survive and other stuff like you sort of you do get the element that those kind of things are just covered and it, yeah. it's not yeah i wish yeah, we saw more of those yeah. driver meetings 
yeah, to be fair, I'd agree. Yeah, they're more I'd interested like in broadcasting more. the press conference than they are. The yeah, right. Media, like that's strange. Would be so much more interesting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, next um, one. Yeah, Darth Kilowog says, Hey there, mon frere. I like that. Uh, after being unable to hold off or catch Alonso, <laughs> at what point is Carlos Sainz's open um, lack of confidence and... Wait, hang on. Carlos Sainz's open lack of confidence and consistent inability to extract anywhere near what Charles Leclerc is out of the car Ooh. going to cause Ferrari to look elsewhere. Uh, think it's fair to note that if Ferrari doesn't botch the pit call for Charles Leclerc at Silverstone... Uh, like last year, he he isn't even a race winner yet. Oh, wow! So someone doesn't like um, Carlos Sainz. I think. I think Sainz is having. He doesn't start seasons well, does he? Like beginning of last season, he was in the gravel every other race. Yeah, yeah that's true. And then as the season went on, I thought Carlos Sainz got better and better, and he sort of seems to have gone back down to a much lower level than the Clare. So it will be interesting to see if he can, you know, bring it back as this season goes on. Um, yeah, I agree with all that. I, th- I think he, he, yeah, he definitely, you know, Imola last year, I think was the low point where he was like, he's going to have to get this together if he's going to continue at Ferrari <laughs> this year. Because yeah, I don't think he had... I think he made, I don't think he scored ten points in the opening like four races last. I don't year. think he did ten laps in the opening <laughs> four races. <laughs> yeah, he just kept retiring, didn't he, and kept having big incidents and and not finishing races. So at least you know he's doing better than last year because he's finishing races at least. So it's a step forward. I agree. I think it does take him a bit of time to get his eye in and to to really get going. Um, hopefully, in the next couple of races, something will click and um, he'll 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 pick it up a bit. Mm. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, um, does anyone want to buy a Carlos Sainz hat on an unrelated note? (laughs) (laughs) Damn it, Tom. (laughs) Uh, Next question from Jeff. Uh, Ciao, amigo. In homage to McCheco, um, Discord person. Discord. (laughs) I struggle to give (laughs) a name who he is there. (laughs) You will know his name from the inbox and the Discord. Um, and an honest question how do you compare Sergio's talent to Max's with this car he really does appear at many tracks to at least be on par with Max if not as shown over the whole weekend to be much better than him do you think he may have a shot at the championship this year is it too early to say whatever Red Bull driver wins in Miami will win the world drivers championship (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think it is too early to say I think this time last year we were saying similar things about Sergio Perez like it was up until I think Monaco where um where he started things started to tail off after Monaco I think for for Sergio Perez last year and it is there is sort of logic to the to the statements that Christian Horner has been making that he does do very well at street circuits mm-hmm. and not necessarily well at more traditional circuits is the politer way of saying it um I would like to see my my, my heart says yes he's in this fight but the jury's kind of out. Like it, we need yeah. to see how he does. I think mm. if he's, I think if he's battling well at Spain, if he can beat Verstappen at, in Spain, then I think he'll be able to fight as long as the car doesn't develop. Because again, last season the car developed out of the window for Perez yeah. into the window for Verstappen as well. So if that car isn't going to be developed that much this season, like we people seem to think it won't be. And that they can still be close when they reach their sort of development peak, then, yeah, I think this year probably Perez has a better chance than he did last year because I don't think the car's going to change as much. And I think if he's on a par with him in Spain, then he'll be able to fight him anywhere. Yeah. Oh, I'll certainly say this is the most confidence I've had in the other Red Bull driver beating Verstappen since Ricardo. By some way, actually. Yeah, uh, I think that's fair. Yeah. Maybe he's yeah. getting driver coaching from Daniel Ricciardo now. Daniel Ricciardo is a Red Bull driver. <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> he's just there on the pit wall with his cap pulled really low. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did you uh, see that? Did you see you, Lewis you Hamilton still... was at um, British Touring Cars recently? Was he? I think it was. Was it a 
Donington, I think, his brother was we've racing. Only had, we've only had and that he, one round, so yeah. Yeah, and he turned up uh, to watch his brother racing with like massive like puffer jacket with the hood up and a balaclava. Mm. So literally all that was visible was his eyes. And he just had a day yeah. out of British touring cars and no one knew he was there. What a legend. That's amazing. So cool. That's so cool. Imagine like seeing that guy and being like, who's that guy with a mask on? <laughs> and then like a week <laughs> or two later being like, that was Lewis Hamilton. <laughs> what? There's going to be so crazy, many good touring car fans. Isn't yeah, it? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, next one from Stephen H says, Hello, podcasters. Red Bull performance aside, why could no one pass anyone this weekend? Did the ride height changes or whatever they changed for this year take us backwards? Yes, I think they have. I think that has happened. Yeah, I think in short, that is the answer. Yeah, we've sort of been hinted at for a few floor weeks, height. but yeah, I think. The floor height, mm, the ride height. Yeah, the so floor height. That sort of broken the new regs a little bit um also mm. as we said they shortened sure. the drs zone which also had a big effect and then again not having any tires left for the grand prix meant they were kind of all just trying to stretch the tires out to the end which also it was yeah. sort of a perfect storm to have no overtaking <laughs> as a track which normally yeah. has quite a lot of overtaking yeah, yeah they 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 managed to ruin what should have been a really good race by not giving botched it like, like we said earlier yeah. by not giving the teams the resources they need to to run a race weekend and which absolutely is like, i would call the sprint race weekend a complete a, an abject failure <laughs> or 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 flip side to this whole viewpoint it's the unpredictable race right you can't predict what's going to happen because it's just crazy you could never predict that nothing would have happened. They'd have had no tires. and You could have not predicted that bit. So maybe that's why they did it. To keep, to maintain the unpredictability. Mm. Maybe. In, they've double bluffed us. They've... Yeah. <laughs> anyway, moving on. Uh, Wes says, hey man, two words. Grid spectacular. Discuss. Apparently they extended the pre-race grid time in Baku by 10 minutes and will do so in Miami for a grid spectacular. Did anyone notice this in Baku? Like any other pre-race stuff? No, uh, I, I literally, because there'd been so much Formula One on and, and I've been watching <laughs> F2 as well, I just tuned in for the bit that I care about, which is the race. The red yeah, because I, I, yeah. I watched it late, so I just like scrubbed through to the race start, so I didn't see any of the preamble. But the, I mean, I mean, I, when, when there's that much going on all weekend, I, what are we supposed to watch every bit of preamble like who on earth is watching all of that so here's here's an interesting thing that i was thinking about when we're talking about it higher up that i'm just going to kind of circle back to right we're talking about how loaded this was and how it's like impossible to kind of watch it all like in real time and i was sort of thinking to myself well this is exactly why i watched most of it like back to back so like i basically saved the shootout and the sprint race and then i just watched one straight into the other like on demand afterwards mm. because of what i wanted to do during the day and then same with sunday to be honest i watched it not live and i feel like weekends like that i used to be the person that would always have fp1 and 2 on in the background whilst i was working on a friday wouldn't yeah. be able to pay full attention but it was always kind of there I'd always have the Ted's notebook thing up after qualifying and I'd watch what Ted had to say while he walked up down the pit, do the same after the race. I'd then go and watch like the F1 equivalents with everyone from the F1 team, which is like a combination of different people that do it over different the, times. The but like driver interviews, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd I'd watch everything at some point over a weekend. This is one of the first weekends where I've watched kind of the bare minimum of I've watched the four like let's call them live sessions and that's it that's all i've watched yeah and this is the first time in years i've done that with a race weekend it's, it's and i think that, that is an there. element of it yeah it's like it feels like the more the more they're throwing at you the less i feel like i want to watch any of it it's like just i just want to i just want to watch some race cars like i don't need all of this stop trying to throw more mm. of it in my face just let me yeah, watch and stop the and good stop race pretending, car stuff. Stop pretending that I want it as well. That's <laughs> yeah. the other thing. Like stop, <laughs> stop shoving it down my throat like it's something that I really love and that I can't get enough of. Like, yeah, I can't get enough of Formula One races. I can't get enough of like an actual Formula One race. 
But all this flim flam that they're throwing around either side of it and trying to trying to do what they're doing to a race weekend is just not working for me. I, just mm. give me give me Formula One as, as it should be. Give me a proper Formula One weekend. And the I think the irony is if they're doing it to try and appeal to someone who is a more casual spectator or somebody newer, they're probably going to turn them off quicker by it being confusing. Mm-hmm. Nobody truly understanding what's going on that's this actually there involved. And they're just being... this Like, people already who were, like, outside of the sport looking in already were like, well, it's just cars going round for an hour and a half. What must they think when it's like, it's cars going round for 30 minutes, then for an hour, then for another 25 minutes, and then for another two hours? Like, what do they actually people, think of this We're not really... Those people, though, you know, we're not interested in those people. No, like, no, but... Those people don't care about Formula One. They're, and they're, but, no matter what you do to Formula One, they'll never care about Formula One. They're no, but I think... I'm not, I'm not saying you've got to entice that person in, but what I mean is, like, the people that were becoming moderately interested of like oh I, i'm sort of understanding it now the people it's you just like yeah 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 it's like somebody watching the mandalorian and then you force feeding them the entire original trilogy followed by <laughs> episode one two three you've, you've got to watch all six of these in order right now because you watched it like it's but not in no, episode order <laughs> not in episode order in chronological order of when they were released <laughs> but like oh my God, it, it is no like i'm trying to watch more indycar this year and like american sport often gets tarred with like the oh it's all pomp and ceremony brush but you stick indycar on it's like someone will belt out the national anthem someone will stand up and say, gentlemen start your engines and then they just get on with it then they just go racing and it just seems so much more it. Then someone gets a trophy for finishing first, someone gets a trophy for finishing second, someone gets a trophy for finishing third, and then someone gets a trophy for finishing tenth <laughs> because they made the most overtakes. It was They were the biggest mover. So a oh, guy I, this I, weekend, I, did you see that tweet? Oh, really? I didn't see it. Yeah, I, yeah. I only basically saw until the checkered flag. So he was the biggest mover and they were like, oh, you, you get this, you get this huge trophy, like a, bigger than <laughs> like from your, from your belly to your brain big, like it's absolutely <laughs> huge. Um, and he was like, what, I get a trophy for finishing 10th. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh no, you're the biggest mover. You, you gain 15 positions. Amazing. Oh, on like a, that, what, on like a 40 car grid? <laughs> so, that, that, puts a little that, Pirelli, yeah. Yeah, that puts a little Pirelli tire of uh, fastest lap or whatever <laughs> it is to shame. Yes. Oh, no, it's a, is it, is it yeah. Paul? I can't remember what it's for. See, look, that's how uh, I look like yeah. yeah, I don't even remember what the tire's the for. The pole lap. <laughs> it's the pole, pole Don't even yeah. care. Right, let's do the last question. Yes. Last question from Sarah. Hey, man, just before De Vries was in the wall and Red Bull Racing pitting Max, Checo was in DRS of Verstappen. Horner says he only gave one team order going into the weekend. Don't repeat Baku 2018, which is the one that Stu referenced uh, a little while ago. Do you think the drivers would have been able to follow that team order? I do. Well, I mean, actually. Yeah, I think they would have. They're, they're capable of it. Yeah, would they right, have actually done it? Right now, the relationship between Verstappen and Perez seems to be all right. It's. Hmm. He's getting by, and yeah. I think Checo is more sensible alongside Verstappen than Ricardo was at that point in time. Yeah, but I don't think there was much Ricardo could have done about that. I think Pet- Verstappen moved and then moved again in the braking zone. So when, let's when not get into move, analyzing a crash from it's <laughs> five years to, ago. If you've done any sim racing, when someone does that to you and you're already on the brakes, there's just nothing you can do about it. And that's what happened to, that's exactly what happened to Ricardo. So Even the, I don't think Ricardo was ever to blame for that. I think it was, I think it was inexperience and immaturity from Verstappen that led to that. And I don't think we have the same Verstappen now as what we no, have. No, that's then. fair. So I don't know whether it would happen again. But. No, it's a different Verstappen. It's a different relationship. And also, it's much earlier in the season. Back here, used to be like quite a way into the season. So there was already like, you know, stuff on the line and bad blood and whatever at that point. Like, we're still, uh, we're a bit early in the year for teammates to be crashing into each other, I think. Unless you're um, Alpine slash Racing Point slash Force India, at which point they all just seem to do it whenever they need. Yeah, I mean, Alpine was kind of like the, you know, the last race that was just 
kind of a mess, wasn't it? That there, there wasn't really much anyone could have. I think that was there. awful. That awful, awful like, around. Ocon could have been off the brakes, but on the brakes to. Yeah, I mean, it was, pink it was cars, a, man. Pink cars seem to yeah. crash into each other more than any other car. <laughs> pink yeah. tracks. But yeah, in answer to the question, um, I think probably they would have been able to avoid that. Incident. I would say so. It, would it have come about? But I think Red Bull saw to it that it was never going to happen anyway by pitting. The I think I think the relationship between Perez and the team is going to break down long before the relationship between Perez and Verstappen breaks down. Can I just point out one thing with all that scenario is I'm glad Red Bull handled it the way they did yeah. because like the undercut wasn't going to give Verstappen that realist. Like he w- he was upset and whinging. So they're like, well, the solution is let's pick you then. Like, yeah, yeah. It, they, it, what, like they could have easily done other things and unceremoniously, for example, call Perez in to get him off his... Like, do you know I mean? They could have definitely handled that differently. And I feel like Red Bull actually were somewhat fair and kind of where they should have been with the, the way that they made the decision. But, they definitely, but irrespe- irrespective of the safety car thing, like they they basically played it into Verstappen's hand of, look, if you think he's on you, we'll come in, we'll change your tyres, whatever. And regardless... Perez would have caught him back up, basically, yeah. is what I'm getting at. Like, yeah, it would I have, think we, it, we forget the safety car altogether at this point. Yeah. The, the, yeah. Let's just not even think about the safety car. But I think car. it was the right way to handle it, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, I think it was the right way to manage the situation as a team. I think Red Bull made the right decision for Red Bull because they knew which they knew that the faster car was behind. So mm-hmm. why why risk the fireworks when you can just bring the slower car in, get them on fresher tyres if mm-hmm. they're already complaining? and get them back out yeah. but unfortunately for them Verstappen's still going to complain because he thinks they got the strategy wrong but well maybe you should have been better be on his faster. tires then yeah the strategy yep. would be faster than your teammates and unfortunately <laughs> he didn't he he didn't execute that strategy in the optimum way out so. of interest has he has he actually said anything like that has he actually said anything about the strategy was wrong has he, he said that um the they the team he felt like the team had made a mistake and that, that it needed to be looked at so it doesn't yeah. happen again but I don't really see what the team could... I think the team had already made a strategic decision based mm. on the, the cards that they had at the time and the safety car was just unlucky. And that's yeah. that's the way it goes yeah. in motor racing sometimes. Sometimes and there's safety cars and you get caught out by them. Yeah. It's exactly what happened to Perez in Saudi Arabia, Jeddah. wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Same thing. It happens. Yeah. yeah. Right. That is it for this week. We've somehow managed to condense that into the usual ninety minute or less format, which I'm I don't think that was that difficult by. to be honest. I think given how how dull that race was. Uh <laughs> the, the, we races, we well. managed to talk about a race for a good forty five minutes considering we said it was boring. That's true. As most per, I was complaining about the sprint to be fair. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. We'll always which find is a way. <laughs> easy fodder. It's low hanging fruit. <laughs> And but, you know, a bit a bit of token criticism of the FIA in there as well, just for good measure. Yeah. Oh, I mean, that's story of the season, isn't it? It's, it's, it's the complete back of the grid episode. <laughs> yeah, the full back of the grid experience. Even even riling up the the less neutral listeners. <laughs> and speaking of, if you'd like to reach out to us and tell us how we riled you up this week, head to Twitter. We're back of the grid F one. Um, head to Facebook. Comment. Yeah, leave leave a comment in in the things <laughs> i mean there's now there's now a questionnaire thing on spotify so this week's question is going to be how did we rile you up and you're going to answer that <laughs> not just yeah. did you like this episode it's going to be how did we rile you up this week question mark i can't wait to see the answer in there because <laughs> people leave some interesting stuff mm, don't buy it don't buy <laughs> don't buy it tom don't, don't no i want it I, I want it okay i want it <laughs> but that is it, yeah. <laughs> Facebook, emails, anything. Let us know. And we will be back next week to review the car park race. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure it'll be fine. I'm not saying it's going to be bad. I'm just saying it's a race around a car park. That is what it is. Fact. It'll be better than last okay. year's, hopefully. Okay, let's go then. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>